The premier eSport organizations in the DMV have teamed up to bring you the DMV's End of Summer Bash. Join us for a three-day online extravaganza to help raise money for the Extra Life Foundation and Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. Taking place August 21st through the 23rd, the DMV's End of Summer Bash will be jammed packed with panels, tournaments, and giveaways for parents, gamers, and the eSport community. Each day will feature TED Talk style presentations, panels on hot topics in esports, and youth showcases. Think you have what it takes to be the best gamer? Sign up for one or all of the end of summer Bash's tournaments, including Overwatch, Rocket League, and Valorant. The Bash will be broadcast live on Twitch, and proceeds will go to benefiting the Children's National Hospital through the Extra Life Foundation. Don't miss out on the hottest event this summer. For more information, check out GameGym.com slash Summer Dash Bash. up level up nation and welcome to the thursday august 20th edition of level up live your home for gaming and esports news brought to you by otn media my name is fiasco his name is courtside king i think if you were here for monday's episode you're officially a friend now so you can call me john you can call him joey uh joey what's up buddy it's thursday uh we have an action-packed weekend this coming up and there's a ton going on in the world of esports and gaming yeah, dude, life is grand right now. Obviously, besides the whole quarantine thing, that's not as fun. Uh, but we've been killing it on Sea of Thieves. Not as much in Valorant, unfortunately. But hey, we're getting better. We're slowly improving thanks to some help from the community. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a great week, a great rest of the week ahead with the weekend, too. Absolutely. Nation, make sure you follow the show on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook at Level Up Live. That, that, uh, level Up Live. It's Thursday, Joey. I'm already ready for the weekend. That is LVLUP Live. And while you're on Twitter, why not give Joey and myself a follow? You can find Joey at Courtside King. You can find myself at Fiasco. Of course, you're watching here live on Twitch. So if you need to know how to spell that, right below these mugshots you're currently staring at on your mobile device or computer, uh, that's our handles. Uh, check us out there as well while you're on Twitter. 
And Nation, as always, if you do wish to listen to the podcast version of the show, the Level Up podcast is available on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. And since you're already listening to the podcast, why not leave us a really awesome review? At least four stars. And anything below four stars, don't even bother. You know, we, we, we don't want it. You know, four stars and above only. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, you can be honest. You can put down a three. We'll go three and a half is the absolute lowest we'll accept. Everything else will be... Um, Deleted. Uh, no, we can't do that. You can't delete reviews. They don't even give you that option. Reviews go a long way helping grow the show and reach new listeners. So if you don't even want to leave a review, just tell a friend, tell a family member, tell the random person you run into at Walmart or Target. You know, I don't, you know, tell someone. You know, that's kind of cool. We, we do appreciate you taking a small moment of your day to let someone know or leave us a really awesome review. All right, Nation, it's Thursday. The Thursday edition is finally here, and there is a ton to talk about. So, Joey, what in the world are we talking about today on August 20th? John, as always, we are hitting on the latest roster moves, some exciting stuff there. We have a few new partnerships to mention, and then we're diving into some new content from the way you have to sign into your Oculus to a new TFT set and much, much more. All right, Joey, I'm switching it up for this next segment here a little bit. So, of course, it's drink a choice segment. I'm going to go ahead and let you go first like we always do, Joey. Your beverage going into this amazing weekend for the last show of this week on August 20th. What is your beverage, sir? OTN crew, we've got a spicy one tonight. Take a look at that label. Oh, yeah, the frog. Uh, this is El Frutero. It's a sour ale brewed with mango, lime, sea salt, and chili peppers from Aslan Beer Company. You know, if <laughs> if I just... You say it was an IPA or no? No, no, no. It's sour. Oh, good. Sour okay, ale. cool. Because if it was an IPA, I would have written it off automatically. Ooh. All right, fam. Shout out to chat. Already popping off. I like this, guys. All right. So, chat, I, I, I need some interaction here with you. All right. So, I do have I do have my Dark and Stormy, my, my rum and ginger, in my Washington Capital Stanley Cup champion glass. So, that is option number one. Option number two, I will take a shot of tequila on stream right now if you choose tequila. So, I need you to choose tequila or rum. Um. That's really going to be your your choice here. So uh, Squirkle says option two. That is the shot of tequila. Panicking Pat says tequila. Booty Trap says teque tequila. I think it's the Todd tequila. Says tequila. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is an airplane bottle of tequila. And just like that. I hope someone down the hatch. that, by the way. Someone get a screenshot Let's go. of beauty. Let's go. And to top it off, we're going to wash it down with a little rum. Mm. Oh, so he was going to do both anyway, practically. I was going to do both <laughs> anyway, but chat, seriously, absolutely fantastic. That is the way you kick off the Thursday episode. So, Joey, we have our drinks. I'm a shot in already. You got to play catch up. Let's get right into gaming and esports news. Let's go. John, we actually, we accidentally prophesied this last week. We have another NA-based org picking up a Valorant roster over in South Korea. This time it's your boys Cloud9, that flag behind you. Not doing so great right now in LCS playoffs, but hey, in Valorant, they are making some moves. Valorant Korea roster is going to consist of Duya, Munchkin, Bazi, Tri, and Moody, along with Coach Autumn as well. Again, John, I like this move. When we look at Valorant, it's still a developing scene. It doesn't have region-locked rosters right now. And similar to what we saw in CSGO, similar to what we saw in Overwatch, they're trying to demo out different waters. Maybe NA is a little too dominated by TSM for them. Or maybe they want to try out some Korean players to possibly move over if Valorant does end up going region-locked. For now, I say why not? I think it's a great move. I don't understand why more organizations don't do this, where they opt to have more. Now, I understand. Yeah, it's, it's money, obviously. But it makes so much sense to kind of test the water in different regions to see, you know, the different players, how they compete. And eventually, like we saw in Overwatch League, Cloud9 ended up dropping, you know, they, they had three rosters. They, they cut two. One of them became the London Spitfire. Cloud9 doing it again now with Valorant. I, I like this move. I think it's incredibly smart. When Valorant does eventually become an organized esports scene, I have a feeling Cloud9 is going to have a very nice uh, option of players to choose from uh, to put together their final roster. I, I love this move, and I love the fact that now Cloud9 is not the only organization doing it. There's other organizations looking at it as well. Well, I mean, look at Cloud9's success with it, too. They did it for Dota 2. They won, like, what, runner-up, I think, in that tournament for the International that year? They did it in Overwatch League. They won the Overwatch League for Season 1 with the London Spitfire. Now they're doing it again for Valorant. Again, the Valorant scene's probably a couple years out, but why not test those players if you have the money to do so? I think that's the biggest obstacle. 
when you look at a lot of these different scenes, a lot of these different organizations, the money might not be there to pick up a 10-man roster or two rosters. So with C9 having that moolah there, why not? Why not test the players? Why not try to find out who's going to be the best of the best? Merge the rosters if you feel a need to. This will give you a leg up on the competition if you can afford it. Now, Joey, uh, chat's making a uh, has a, a little question here in regards to how big a Valorant League could be. Uh, not having to dive too deep into it, um, you know, when you take a look at like CS:GO and other first-person shooters out there, you know, I, I, they do pretty well. They have a very solid. Uh, viewer base, they have a large fan base with Valorant being so new but with the hype that surrounded Valorant, everything from the uh, closed beta where you had to watch everything on Twitch to, to gain access to it to present day now, we're several months into into Valorant uh, when an organized esports scene finally is put together how big do we think, that the, how big can this scene be? I mean, it really depends, guys. Like, if we look at it the way we are now, it's backed by Riot Games. You look at League of Legends, most of their leagues are 10-team leagues. So if they do eventually go to franchising with that team league format, I would guess about 10 teams per region. Now, if we look at CSGO, though, it's kind of open table, really. Every tournament can be enrolled in. There's a ton of different organizers. It's not just organized by Valve. Um, I don't even think Valve organizes any of them. Um, up front, to be completely honest. But when you look at the CSGO scene, it's a bunch of different organizers and people can enroll based on their organization. I don't even think it's as region locked with CSGO, uh, minus a couple tournaments here and there for their organizers. So I think it really depends what route they go. If they go the League of Legends franchise route and try to lock it into certain teams and try to make your sponsorship revenue that way, then I'm thinking 10, maybe 20 at max team per region. But if they do go that other route with CSGO, I think they really leave it completely open. I think they say, if you want to buy in, you can buy in. Maybe they lock organizations from having two teams. But overall, I think it becomes much more open if they go that route. Which, by the way, guys, chat, that's the route they're going to go for the first couple of years. They've already said, at least for year one and possibly for year two as well, they're going to have organizers run events, and then they're going to make a decision on the esports scene from there. So that's kind of a TBD for now, as Kieran Thill would say. So we'll have to wait and see how that one develops. Our last roster move of the week, John C9 has also added another player. They added a new Hearthstone Battlegrounds and TFT player into the mechs in Porsche. Um, I think this is a decent move as well. I don't think either one of these scenes are going to pop off like a League of Legends or a Dota 2, but it doesn't hurt to add another player, especially if they can compete in both titles. Yeah, I mean, w when you have a dual threat player that can play in two different titles, um, obviously from a money standpoint, you're going to save. Uh, you can you know, obviously the player can compete in, in two games. That's one player, not two. So that cuts the salary in half automatically. Uh, yeah, th th I mean, these scenes are so, you know, would you would you put them tier two? Maybe, maybe tier three when it comes to esports? Even lower tier, tier plastic? Tier three or lower. Tier three or I, lower. I mean, they're just not as big of games. Yeah. They don't have the sponsorship revenue. They don't have the player base. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's smart. Not that Cloud9 couldn't afford two players, but I think it's a smart move in getting a player that's a dual threat, um, especially in the lower tier esports scene. Yeah, and it's either pronounced Porsche or Portia, but I don't 100% know how, like, I don't know what he does as a streamer, but I would assume if you're playing in both leagues, you probably stream both titles as well. So you're not only hitting that Hearthstone title or that TFT title, but you're hitting both as well in the stream. So you throw a C9 banner up on that, you're getting that Hearthstone audience, you're getting that TFT audience, you're getting whatever he, he other game he decides to stream that evening. So I think tackling that from that perspective, I don't know what the pay grade looks like, but the fact that you're playing in two scenes, you have the opportunity at two prize pools, and you have that opportunity to hit two different, completely different crowds in a sense, uh, minus the CCG versus auto chess genre. So I like it. I think it's good. Great move, C9, making some big moves over there. Into partnerships and investments, LOL Esports has announced Cisco as their official enterprise networking partner. John, I don't think there's a ton we have to touch on this. I think it's just another big move from Riot and LOL Esports. They continue to lock down partners week after week, it feels like. And if you're a league, the way you're going to survive is, A, if it's franchising, teams are going to pay you. But the big, big one is sponsorship. When you look at sponsorship, you need viewers, you need people interacting with your league. And for them to continue to pull in sponsors and sponsors after sponsors, it just shows how well the league is succeeding and how it continues to grow. Joey, how nice is it that league pulled in a sponsor that's not controversial? I mean, okay. I mean <laughs> most of their sponsorships are not controversial, sir. They did have one. The LEC made some hiccups I, I, over I, there. I'm just saying that, you know, if, for... Uh, <laughs> Look, look, I, I get it. 
like for, from a business standpoint, I understand why certain sponsorships are made. Um, but at the same time, I feel like, you know, just like you said, I think it was maybe like a lapse of judgment uh, when they made that one partnership that is now ended after social media outrage and rightfully so. Um, Cisco, uh, I, I like this uh, networking partner. I think it's smart. Um, there's a lot of different uh, marketing opportunities through esports. And I think LOL Esports and Riot Games is really kind of ahead uh, in that marketing department, pretty much going the route of traditional sports in marketing and selling everything. The official networking property, you know, partner. You know, how many people are going to be, you know, setting up a, a, I don't know, a server in their house? Be like, oh, I need Cisco backed up. No, I mean that's not going to do it. But at the end of the day, that's money being brought in by Riot Games and LOL Esports. So I, I, I like the move. I think it's smart, uh, and it's uh, it's cool to see Cisco jump into esports too. Right, and I think the big win here is that it's a global partner. Yeah. So when we look at a lot of the different ones, it's the LEC picking up a European partner or the LCS picking up a North American-based partner. Sometimes they cross a little bit here and there, but a company like Cisco is much more worldwide. They have that reach, they have that breadth, and they're going to be able to do this for multiple leagues. Under the LOL Esports umbrella, you can hit South Korea, you can hit China, North America, Europe, so on and so forth. And now having this on that global scale, it's going to allow that reach from all those different leagues as opposed to one specifically. My throat and this jalapeno beer, whew, this was a poor decision, friends. Uh, <laughs> it is like stinging and sour, and yeah, it's good times over here. I have another uh, one of these if you want me to, to to bring it to you, if you want to take a shot of tequila real quick. I had a lot of tequila last night, actually. We'll <laughs> keep that for after the show. Oh, yeah, uh, A new TFT set is on. I did. I you mixed it with share. coconut, by the way. It was very good. Um, a new TFT set is on its way, John. A little team fight tactics, a little auto brawler here and there. Uh, we have very few details so far for set four, but we do know it's going to be titled Fates. So you'll be choosing your fate a little bit here. Uh, some of the things that will include dragons, magic, spirits, and storms. Oh, my. This, to me, John, sounds like a continuation of Spirit Blossom, uh, similar to that anime style of skin we're getting in League of Legends with the events, the new characters. Uh, this, to me, is kind of the continuation of that into the TFT set. I like it. I'm a fan of dragons. I like some magic here and there. Storms, bring the lightning, friends. Uh, I'm stoked for this new set. It sounds cool. Um, the the fairy tale aspect I, to me, like like the dragons and spirits, and it's all overdone. Um, it's not surprising. I thought the galaxy um, portion of TFC was very unique and different. The the, the Nico verse where you started out with uh, two Nico helpers that essentially could give you. Uh, instantaneously a level two, or if you saved it, to, saved it for later in the game, could give you uh, that advantage to get into a tier three or a gold uh, champion on the board as well. I thought that was very unique. Um, but I will sit back and wait to see what kind of uh, crazy ideas Riot comes up with um, for the Fates set. But I, I think it should be unique and add some uh, twists here into TFT for the players. I mean, I'll be honest, Sean, and this is probably an unpopular opinion over there with chat and the listeners. Um, I like the original. I'm all about vanilla TFT. I thought Elemental was not that great. I thought Galaxies looked cool, but I think the universes were crazy. I just like the plain original, like a vanilla type of TFT. Boomer. I mean, did you not like the original? I thought it was just like nice. I mean, we got our original fun. skins of champions. Now I have a Zyra that's looking crazy that I can't even tell it's a Zyra half the time. Like, I don't know. I just, I like the plain vanilla. I, you have a very valid point with that. When they changed the skins in TFT, it made it very difficult to figure out what champions they were by just glancing at them, especially when they were skins that weren't featured in, you know, the full League of Legends game. It was just a tweak inside of TFT. Um, no, I completely agree. I think it was very, very difficult uh, to, to pick that up. And original TFT did allow the use of the original splash art, the original icons of the champion. So it made it a little bit easier, but I mean, who doesn't like a challenge? You know, we got to relearn what characters look like. Relearn what characters look like. Well, guys, if you want to learn the new fate set and test your own fate, you can do so September 16th with patch 10.19. Oh, John, this next one's going to have you excited. <laughs> so friends out there that like their VR or might be looking into a new Oculus headset, Oculus users will now need a Facebook account to log in starting very soon, October 2020. Uh, so this is a big thing. It's got a huge uproar going on in social media, especially Twitter right now. Uh, when you look at a lot of younger generations, they are not enjoying Facebook. Facebook's known for taking data, 
Facebook throws an ad up for just about anything you search, I feel like nowadays. Uh, it's just one of those things where a lot of people do not like the data that Facebook pulls from them based on their clicks, based on their profile. Now they're saying, okay, so gamers, you already told us we don't like you, but in order to use our VR headset that is well regarded, you're going to have to get an account with us and sign into it. A lot of people not happy about this one. I. Uh yeah, um, congratulations to all the boomers on Facebook um, that don't even know how to plug a VR headset into your computer, uh, that don't understand how to use a VR headset in general, um, that are probably trying to figure out what VR even stands for, um, because you guys will have access uh, to the Oculus. I mean, and, and that's fantastic. I, I encourage all the boomers to finally come to the 21st century. It's not 1950 anymore. Um, crazy. We have computers that don't take up a full room. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's great for boomers. But no, Joe, you make an absolutely fantastic point. Younger generations don't have Facebook anymore. I mean, I have Facebook. You have Facebook. I think I signed on Facebook five days ago. And I don't think I've been back since. Um, I have no desire to check my Facebook profile. I would rather be on Twitter. I'd rather be on Instagram. Now, Instagram, obviously owned by Facebook. Um but there's so many other places that I would rather be than on Facebook. It's a toxic cesspool. Uh, sometimes it feels like even worse than Twitter at times. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think this is a bad move overall. I'm like, you're going to limit your, your base. I mean, we have several Gen Z members in OTN's Discord. Uh, and the only reason they have a Facebook profile is because they want to have access to uh, the games on Facebook. And they haven't even played those games on Facebook in years. And this isn't going to make them want to go back if they want to get a VR headset. They're going to look at other options than the Oculus. I think this is them shooting themselves in their foot by putting this behind the Facebook um, gate, if you will. But on the other side, for Facebook, it you know I think it's a, a decent move, if you will, because now you're going to try to force the younger generations to come to Facebook to open up a profile. You're trying not to go the way of MySpace. If you guys don't know what MySpace is, Google it. Um, you know, it, they're trying to survive. They realize that in 20 years, Facebook is going to be a graveyard of memorials because all the boomers, you know. So, anywho, uh, not, not to get too dark, but, you know, it, Facebook is not exactly young generation minded. And that's the problem. You put up, you put Oculus behind that Facebook account. Uh, paywall, if you will, or or gate, you, you shoot yourself in the foot. Okay, I'm going to present a situation here that's kind of a win-win for everyone. So Facebook owns Instagram. The younger generation loves Instagram. It has its own separate login if you so choose so. Why not make it an option to log in with an Instagram on Oculus? I don't even think half the people that use Instagram realize it's owned by Facebook, even though it's in like tiny print in certain areas. So I, I think if you're Facebook and you still want that data... That's the way to go. It allows people to buy into it, not feel as attacked as trying to have to make a Facebook account. But then again, everyone can kind of win in a sense. Facebook's still going to do its thing. It's still going to pull your data, regardless if you make an account with it or not. It'll find a way to do it, I'm sure. That's just kind of how they work over there. But overall, I really think it was a missed opportunity here, forcing a Facebook account as opposed to giving that Instagram account option as well. Yeah, I think Instagram would have been the smart way to go. And yeah, you're right, Joe. I just double checked my Instagram app. It says at the very, very bottom, it says, by Facebook or from Facebook. And that was um, added a while ago, like a couple months back, I believe. Yeah, and but at least they were smart enough to put it in an area that a lot of people aren't going to mm -hmm. look at, i.e. the bottom of the screen. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's smart. But no, I think you have a very valid point. They should put it behind Instagram, if anything. Um, but then if you're Facebook now, you realize that your user base on Instagram is not boomers, but the younger generations. And now, if, you know, Either way, you're going to cut a segment of the population out. But hey, at least with Instagram, you're going to hit the segment of the population that actually knows VR and is willing to use VR. So I, I think that well, would have been smarter. Both though. ways. Like you look at so many different sites. It's like log in with Facebook, log yeah. in with Google, log in with Yahoo. Why not throw Facebook and Instagram up there? If people know that don't know the difference, they don't know the difference. Why not? So guys, if you're going to get an Oculus, get ready to get a Facebook account as well if you don't already have one. Uh, this is a fun one, John. So we've been in the middle of this whole Call of Duty reveal recently. Uh, we mentioned it on the podcast actually two months ago, but the official name has now officially came out uh, after we gave it to you guys a while back. It is Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. There's going to be a full reveal for it on August 26th with elements of the reveal being shown in Warzone as well. Um, so similar to what we see with Fortnite, guys. Fortnite puts on these concerts. Fortnite puts on these videos making fun of Apple. 
Fortnite continues to build into their system and make it kind of an event uh, in and of itself. That's kind of what Call of Duty and Activision are looking at here. How can we can continue to develop our Battle Royale platform? How can we continue to build upon this with players already in the system? And they're going to try to do it here with the reveal of this game on August 26th. Yeah, I I am not a fan of putting Black Ops in front of it. I feel like Black Ops has that connotation of beyond spacey future kind of thing, especially when it comes to the Call of Duty titles. Um, just call it Call of Duty Cold War. Um, as soon as you put Black Ops on there, and to me, I just automatically think of you know sci-fi guns, sci-fi weapons, and and sci-fi time traveling back to the era of Cold War. Obviously, you know. That's probably not what it's going to be, but that's just the instant reaction I have. And Call of Duty has no one to blame but themselves for that reaction because of just how horrific. I mean, not horrific, but just how sci-fi the whole Black Ops um, era of Call of Duty has been. I hate Black Ops. Um, I, I'm just, <laughs> as someone who's a big Infinity War fan, I am not a fan of Treyarch. I do not like the games they've made. Like World of War was kind of fun for a while. I like the kill streak where I could get dogs running after people. That was good times. Um, but overall, I've just not been a big fan of their style. I have not liked the Black Ops series. I'm not really invested in their level up system. Uh, a little bit of pun intended there. Uh, not really enjoying the way they've done skins. I've just I've not really liked the Black Ops titles. The Cold War though, I think is cool. I think the Cold War is one area we really haven't seen explored all that much in video games, to my knowledge. Um, what's the other title that I'm thinking of? Metal. Medal of Honor. Did they ever do Cold War? That's a great question. I I don't know if they did either. Know. I will go and Google. Thank you, Google. And then John's going to get ads for Medal of Honor for the next week. Um, but overall, I like that style. I think bringing up a new historical period, or maybe not new, but something that hasn't been as explored as much as a World War II or a World War One, where we have tons and tons of titles. Uh, this kind of takes a little bit of a depth that we haven't maybe seen in video games before, or at least a refreshed view at it. So I do like that. I think the setting is great. I think Cold War will be fun. A lot of questions that they can answer and a lot of things they can build upon. The Black Ops style is what holds me back. Do I think I'll get this game? Probably not. Do I like that they're revealing it in Warzone? I absolutely love that. I mean, Fortnite has shown us how much success that can have. Why not try again from the Call of Duty brand? Why not throw it in there? You have tons and tons of players. It's been doing extremely well. Have a little fun with the reveal. You're a little late in the game from when you usually reveal games. Why not change things up and make it interesting? Uh, I can confirm, and chat, uh, Squirkle backs me up on this. Uh, no, they did not do call, uh, Cold War for Medal of Honor. So, so I don't know War. if anyone did Cold War. Um, so you have games that kind of tease with the Cold War era. Um, here's a throwback for you that everyone knows. GoldenEye 007 was technically against the Soviets. Um, uh, roughly around the so Cold War. I guess War. that would have been Cold War, wouldn't it? Yes, but it wasn't exactly focused on Cold War, like, the whole thing there is this more just the whole spying aspect of everything and and secret Soviet helicopters and all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, I feel like I feel like you're 100 percent correct there, Joey. The Cold War era um, of human life or <laughs> whatever um, hasn't really been explored that much in video games. It, it, it's a very um, forgotten piece in video game history when it comes to focus and works. It just feels like. You know, World War One, World War Two. Um, I, I, you can throw Vietnam in there as well. There's not that many Vietnam titles out there uh, when it comes to, to video games. But you know, World War One, World War Two, definitely World War Two. Um, for lack of better terms, the 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 sexy war to use in video games uh, because I think everyone in the world can get behind the fact that Nazis are bad. Um, so it feels like World War Two makes it very easy uh, to make a video game around that. Where you know you make something about Soviet Russia, then you, your game doesn't get sold in Russia. Like you have to change everything or, you know, it's, it makes things weird. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. So we'll see what they can do with it from John and I's perspective. It's a great area to hit on and it hasn't been hit as much in video games at the same point, not the biggest fan of black ops. So we'll see what they can do. Deathloop, one of the PS third-party exclusives that was supposed to be around launch time, is now delayed till quarter two of 2021. Again, guys, not too much to hit on this. We see this happening over and over in the video game industry right now. Halo Infinite has been delayed. Cyberpunk was delayed twice. The Last of Us Part Two was delayed. Uh, I feel like there's like 10, 15 other titles out there that I'm missing that have been delayed as far as major releases. And a lot of that's due to COVID. I mean, you have a lot of people moving to work from home. 
the projects might not get done as successfully or the environment that they're in might be a little harder to work in or maybe the I guess the technology and the equipment that they need might not necessarily be available to them as accessibly. So I think one of the things we're going to continue to see, and I don't think this is the last announcement either, we're going to continue to see games move back probably two to three months for a lot of them. Not a big fan of that, by the way, but I think overall, like when we see games move back, I think it is a good thing to know that developers are putting in that extra time. I would much rather wait two months to get a complete game as opposed to getting a game that's not quite where we want it at and has to be three or four patches later when you start losing people playing it. John, we recently spoke about Microsoft choosing to delay the launch of Halo Infinite as well. They are delaying to 2021, and we do not have an exact date on that yet. However, more speculation continues to come about regarding this project. I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. According to a report from IGN, the game's development was hindered by outsourcing. So we do know that three or four other companies are working with um, 343 on this as well. They're building out certain parts from graphic engines to different parts of the campaign. So it is being outsourced. We do know that as a fact. The other part of this coming out of an IGN article is that they have been distracted from the upcoming Showtime Halo TV series uh, as well being a distraction to the higher ups in the company. So since then, this article came out, I think it was yesterday or the day before, 343 members, I think there's been three or four of them who have come out, uh, 343, ironically, uh, they've come out and mentioned that, hey, this is not true. This is not the case of what's happening in the company. What's your thought on this? So we've seen this a lot. We've seen companies come out where articles will come out about them, and some have been very false. Some have had hints of truth. Some have been directly on, like we saw with BioWare previously with Anthem. With 343 and Halo, what parts are you thinking are true here and what parts do you think are just being made up? I'm going to tell you why Halo TV series is a distraction and why that's a good thing. Now, we have talked multiple times on this show about how video game shows and movies have been nothing short of hot garbage. Even Warcraft the movie which did have some input from Blizzard, was still overall bad. Uh, they, I mean, graphically, it was fine. It, it, was, it was great. The story is what really butchered it. Um, the, this is why it's a good thing for Halo. If they're being distracted, that means they are very involved with the creation of this series. They're, they're being... Uh, that reference that the show creators need, they're talking about the lore, they're talking about the history, they're talking about what is in Halo, what is not in Halo, what can be put in, what can't be put in. To me, that tells me that the developer of Halo is directly involved with that creation of that TV series, which, fingers crossed, means it won't totally suck. Um, that That is why I think it might be a good thing but at the same time, as a video game fan, you don't want to see the video game delayed um, too much. Obviously, you know, in recent years, we've seen big titles get delayed. A lot of people are happy with delays, especially after the nightmares of video games like No Man's Sky, where we have like a lot of big games that are hyped up. And you can maybe even throw Anthem and maybe even Destiny in there, too, where these titles are hyped up and then the, t the game comes out and it doesn't feel complete. It feels like it's only 40 percent or 50 or 60 or 70 percent, but yet we're paying full price for it. And then we have to wait two or three years for DLC that maybe adds 45 minutes of content that maybe adds a little bit here, a little extra for the player. And in some cases, you have to pay extra for that DLC. Uh, so, I mean... I feel like gamers are more uh, open to the idea of titles being delayed. And I feel like if you're a multimedia fan, if you're a really big fan of Halo, this may not be a bad thing if the TV story is true, because that means that Halo content in a TV series might be actually good. Well, sir, I'll be honest. I did not expect you to take that pathway with this uh, why one. Not? Why not? Um, really diving into the movie aspect a lot more than I've really considered. So I can see it as a slight distraction. I don't think it's a major distraction. I think that's BS in my opinion. I mean, when you look at it, you're a game development company. Yes, you have other parts moving here, obviously, especially for the C-suite, the executive type of members, and you're going to overlook it. And like you said, John, I think you bring up a great point. It is good to know if this has some truth to it that they're being involved in the development process. 
that they're saying, hey, let's stick this to the lore. Let's make sure it's accurate. That kind of stuff being developed into this TV series. If that's the case, I think it's a huge win. Do I think the whole executive committee, like IGN almost projects here, is that involved with the movie taping that they're not focusing on the game? There is no way in hell. I mean, you look at Xbox, you look at Sasha Nadella, you look at Phil Spencer. This is what people's jobs depend on. I mean, this is your franchise. This is your biggest franchise. This is like Sony saying, oh yeah, God of War is going to be delayed with our launch. Or Nintendo saying, we're not having a Mario game for a couple months. This is the Mario or the God of War of Xbox. They're known for the big Halo campaigns. They're known for the multiplayer. There is no way that anyone in that executive is that focused on this movie that they're not focused on the game. With that being said, I think there are issues. If you're going to ask me what the issue is, it's the fact that they let the creative director go in 2018. If you're three years into development of a game and you lose your main creative director and then you lose the runner-up for creative director, that to me is the issue. Where's your creative direction at that point? Do you continue going with the vision of this guy that was supposedly fired? Probably not. How much do you switch up in that two-year period for this campaign? This to me all comes down to that creative director. Whether they knew the pacing was off, I think that could be an executive problem. They probably need to have a bit more regular meetings. Maybe there's some, I don't want to say dishonesty, but some miscommunication going on between the teams of how ready they are. But to me, it's not the movie. It's not necessarily these other little rumors that are popping up. It's the fact that they lost a creative director two years ago and then trying to develop this massive game with already three years of things being built and switching the creative direction from there. So that to me is the big reason. I will go over and over about it. I think it's silly that people are saying this movie is the biggest distraction. I mean, I get it if a little bit, but I highly doubt this derails a whole game to be delayed months later. I'm very feisty on that one, if you can't tell. I can tell. I, have to pull I, out my, I, I threw my you off. Toad. I, 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 I threw you off with the whole take on uh, on the uh, the... The TV show. I like it though. That was something I never considered really. Like I didn't think of the positive of that, but I do like that approach. Uh, John, this might be the biggest news of the week. So yes, we have game delays. Yes, we have roster signings. Yes, we have partnerships and fun news there. But John, Tim, the tap man got his crown, son. Fall guys. Tim has been at it for over a week. It feels like at this point, continuing to go, continuing to grind, continuing to fail. The Fall Guys account, making fun of him. It felt like like every hour on the hour, every day as he continued to try. He found his way over to Warzone, and the Fall Guys account on Twitter kept poking at him. Come back and try again. Eventually, Tim got his crown, and if you guys have not seen the video of him getting it, it is 100% pure joy to watch, especially if you can find one with the Titanic music tied to it as well. Now, Joey, I, I was the positive voice last topic. Allow me to sprinkle in a little doubt here. Uh, it has come out that apparently the person he was going up against in the hexagon level was Nade Shot, and Nade Shot threw to give Tatman the win. So whether you believe it or not, there is some doubt out there. There's a little bit of a conspiracy theory. But nonetheless, I was one of those 300,000 watching. It was absolutely fantastic to see Tim uh, finally get that win, uh, to get the crown. I mean... That's that's content like w w the emotion he showed. I mean, Joey, 300,000 people tuned in hundreds of thousands of people watched him as he lost for hours, five, six, seven hours a day for over a week, just losing constantly. How many people would tune in to a streamer that wasn't successful? that made mistakes that caused him to lose in the second round of Fall Guys, that, that made you die instantly in, in the first round of Valorant or, or every round of Valorant when you play like you make a stupid decision and all of a sudden... People don't stick around for that. But for this, for he, he, was, he was poking fun at himself. You know, every time he would lose, like he would put up like, oh, this, this is a you know, loser cam and, you know, a, 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 an upset picture of himself on there too. And like he, he made it fun. And then when he finally won, I mean, guys, let's be real here. 300,000 people watching you lose. And then when you finally win, like that's a lot of pressure on you to perform and actually win. And he did it. And it was a lot of fun. I, I love the reaction. I thought it was fantastic. I think that the Titanic cut of him winning is absolutely fantastic. Also, uh, I like uh, Fall Guy's response to him. And I love the fact that even ESPN's Twitter account tweeted the video of him winning which, of course, chat, you know it, the boomers went wild on Twitter about this isn't sports content. 
Well, you want to know something? There's not a whole lot of sports going on in the world right now. You know, so yeah, let's go ahead and throw Tim the Tatman up there too, because ESPN, that E stands for entertainment. Last time I checked, video games qualify, even if it's a content creator and streamer and not a pro esport gamer. Uh, so congrats to Tim the Tatman. I think it was absolutely fantastic. And I believe Fallout Guys challenged him to now get five wins in a row. Um, I don't see that happening anytime soon. But. His reply to that was great, by the way. It was like, come on, man, or seriously, what? I don't remember what it was, but it was great. It's like one dub is enough uh, for now. But uh, again, big congrats to Tim. That's absolutely fantastic. And Joey, the amount of subs he got after he won blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. Yeah, it was at least 5K guys that came in in the middle of like, I would say five, 10 minutes of time right after his win. But like you said, John, there, yes, there's the conspiracy out there. Someone threw Nate Shot in this case that gave him the crown potentially. But when you look at it, guys, I doubt he knew that was Nate Shot doing that, or I doubt that clicked with him at that point because it was pure joy on his face. If, if he was able to fabricate that, I just, he's the best actor in the world, in all honesty. Like, there is just pure joy emanating from his face when it happened. You could tell the relief of the stress was off of him. He's like, honey, grab me a Bud Light seltzer. Like, it was just, it was so funny to watch, and it was great. It was just, it was one of those really nice moments to have in a year like 2020 when there's been so many negatives. To see something that started out negative and end up really positive was really fun. Overall, guys, I believe his stats ended up like 344,000 viewers were watching on Twitch at the time. Uh, Twitch stats are not exactly that accurate. Uh, even with smaller channels like ours, it will miss things here and there. Uh, at one point when I was in there, I saw 377,000. So he very well could have been north of what he's showing on Twitch. Um, but overall, great stuff for him. And also a shout out to Fall Guys on Twitter. They have been killing it on Twitter. Whether it be the Tim the Tapman stuff, whether it be the fact that they're auctioning off a Fall Guy type of character for, uh, shoot, what's the charity they're doing it for? Do you remember? Uh, let me pull it up. It's, yeah, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but they're doing it for charity. Uh, they have a bunch of people bidding on it. G2 Esports is bidding. Ninja's bidding. Um, I think Aim Lab is one of the big bidders over there. And last I checked, it was a bidet company based in France, I believe, that was currently leading. Uh, so a lot of people being engaged on that Twitter account. They already have a million followers. They have already passed Dota 2 and CSGO just about two weeks after their launch as well. This account tweets way too much. It tweets quite a bit. Anyway, it's guys, awesome. <laughs> it's a charity out there. Go check it out. Obviously, most of us do not have the money to put forth like a ninja or like a potentially Elon Musk later down the line. Uh, Mr. Beast, I think, is involved, and everyone knows he throws cash at all different things. Uh, so it's craziness, but it is just getting up there higher and higher. I think there's like 10 days left of it as well. For those of you on PC and on the Epic Game Store, I believe this is still active. Don't hate me if it is not, but it's supposed to end sometime today. Remnant from the Ashes and the Alto Collection are currently free on the Epic Game Store. Again, I don't know if that's still current. Uh, it was supposed to end sometime today. I just don't know the time. So check that out if you're interested in those games. DC Fandom takes place this Saturday, August 22nd. A number of new games will be shown, including Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League from Rocksteady and a new Batman game that's going to be centered around the Court of Owls as the villain. Lots of exciting things coming from them and WB Montreal. Uh, John, I'm pretty stoked for DC Fandom. We will be doing the end of summer bash, so we'll have to catch it later on. Um, but we do know at least two Batman themed games will be coming out along with a number of other video game titles and some very fun DC superhero related news. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit. Suicide Squad killed the Justice League. That's what I'm hyped about. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, players be able to play uh, the role of the bad guy, if you will, uh, to take down the Justice League. Uh, I'm hyped for that. I, I, I can't wait to see. Uh, more information about that game. I want to see screenshots. I want to see gameplay. I want to know more about it. I I'm hyped for that game. And John, chat has updated me as well. So if listeners of the podcast and Twitch chat members, Enter the Gungeon and God's Trigger are now the free games on Epic. So it does look like that has been reset. Uh, a couple other things, and then we'll just jump into some esports and wrap up the show. Guys, we did have some game launches this week. Uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator launched on Game Pass. Uh, Battletoads launched as well. And then the Mortal, I just crossed it out and I can't find it. Mortal Shell also released this week. So guys, three big games dropping this week. Uh, some bigger than others, obviously. Some a little bit more riveting or riveting, they could say. Um, but there's some fun games out there for Game Pass players as well as PC, Xbox, and PlayStation gamers as well. And, and Additionally, John, yes, go real ahead, quick, please. Uh, no chat. Fiasco Sim 2020 is not being released this year. 
Uh, it's yeah, like it got a, moved to a quarter it was two delayed. of 2021. It was, it was delayed. So it's, it's we fine. have to do some more recordings for Fiasco <laughs> Sim, but we're getting there, ladies and gentlemen. It'll be out and it'll be without Oculus too. We're actually moving that partnership over <laughs> to HTC. No more Facebook accounts needed for John Sim. Last but not least, guys, we will be casting Rocket League on Saturday and Valorant on Sunday for some fun tournaments for the end of Summer Bash for the DMV area. Uh, if you guys are in the DMV or online, feel free to register. We can punch those out and chat here shortly. Uh, or if Panicking Pat is still around, maybe he can post the links. Uh, guys, those events will be kicking off at 2 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday and Sunday, respectively. Uh, come compete. Come check out. John and I will be casting a lot of the event as well. So it should be a good time, John. I'm really excited for this event. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. We'll actually be on site. Uh, which is kind of weird considering for like the past four months we've been doing everything, uh, you know, in our own home studios. And, and now we're actually going to be back in a studio in the same room, Joey. It's going to be weird seeing you. It's been like forever in person, at least. It's been a hot minute. I mean, ever since we started filming Fiasco Sim, it really hasn't Fiasco. been too much since then. <laughs> With that, guys, there's not too much else happening. I think DC Fandom is going to be the big event outside of End of Summer Bash this weekend. And then we have some exciting stuff with Gamescom the following week. But we'll wait to touch on that. For now, let's touch a little bit on esports, particularly with the LEC and LCS, which are jumping into some playoff action. John, over in the LEC, I think one of these is actually played today, but it has not updated on here. Um, for LEC, do we have the results of that game? Did they play today? Uh, thought they did. Schedule here i'm not oh, i don't know if they did someone on twitter lied to me it's friday it is friday rip well fam we still have playoffs coming for the lec i think john and i did predictions before no actually we held off because playoffs weren't happening so let's do predictions now in round one of the winner's bracket we have rogue as the number one seed choosing fanatic as their opponent john rogue and fanatic rogue the number one seed overall rogue already qualified for worlds Fnatic being that legendary organization that has never really missed Worlds, but does have a good shot of missing it this time if they end up starting to fail in this playoff format. Who do you think wins round one here of Rogue versus Fnatic? Oh, this is tough. Fnatic's not going to go down without a fight. You, you can be 100% sure about that. Rogue has been very, very impressive. And please, Joey, correct me. Fnatic's record against Rogue this year is 0-2, correct? Or did they split? Uh, that's a great question, sir. Come on. Um, I think they split. Okay. So anywho, I think, I think this has the possibility of going the distance and just because I'm currently salty about what's happening in the LCS right now, I'm going to say rogue takes it three, two. Yeah. I think rogue is going to win this one as well. I mean, fanatic always seems to get a buff when it comes to best of fives. Normally, I would pick Rogue 3-1 here, the way they're playing compared to the way Fnatic has played recently. But with it going to a best-of-five format, I think that really does give Fnatic a bit of an advantage. So I do think Rogue is underrated, and I will stay... Yeah, I'm going to take Rogue to win still. I think they do come out 3-2, but Fnatic starts to get a little bit of that fight back in them. Over to our next matchup, we have G2 up against Mad Lions. G2 being the number three seed really for the summer, number three, four range. Uh, they did end up in the second seed based on spring seeding, though. So they do take on the Mad Lions here. Mad Lions, who did knock them out of the winner's bracket in the spring before G2 came back to beat Mad Lions. G2 Mad Lions for the summer, though, John, who are you taking? This is another tough one because like, what, what G2 is going to show up? Mad Lions, right up there with Rogue, been incredibly impressive this split. Um, they're playing well. Um, G2, it, you know, they're hit and miss. Uh, I think this has the potential of going the distance again. I am, you know what? Why not? I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna stay on the train. I'm gonna say Mad Lions 3-2. Yeah, both teams have been out of form here. Mad Lions got really sloppy toward the end. G2s look sloppy all springs or all summer split. Again, I give them the same advantage that I give to Fnatic, though. When it comes down to best of fives, I think G2 is going to get a little bit of a buff here with the way they draft, with the way Grabs coaches them. Uh, I'm going to take G2 actually out of this one, but I will give Mad Lions a little benefit of the doubt. I will go 3 2 G2. I would not be surprised if G2 goes 3 1, though, as well. And that brings us down to tomorrow's matchup. Kicking off this Friday is Schalke 04. After going 0-10, pulling the miracle runoff to get that final seed into playoffs, they have made it here, and they are up against SK in their starting matchup. Momentum, momentum, momentum. Do not count Schalke out. 
Um, that is an impressive run going eight. No, I don't care what league you're in. Uh, they have all the momentum. I, I think Schalke is going to take down the number five seed in SK gaming. Uh, and I, I think they'll do it three, one. Wow. We got toxic spans in chat over there hating on C9, but we're still in LEC. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think Schalke has the momentum, John, like you said, to start out 0 and 10, to pull that season around or that split around and to make it into playoffs, you are on the highest of horses that you can be on right now. You are feeling so good. You're gelling well. I think they took down Mad Lions. I think they took down Fnatic. I think they took down G2 all on their way to these final weeks of making their way into playoffs. They are on fire right now. I would be absolutely stunned if SK wins this one. I think Schalke wins. I could see it being tight. Personally, I'm going to go 3-1 Schalke, though, coming out. And guys, this is the loser's bracket at this point. So if Schalke or SK loses, they are out of there. There is no second chance. This is the end. One life is all they have. If they get that loss, goodbye, friends. Uh, but really, I think the story of this right now is going to be Fnatic. Fnatic is that legendary team that everyone expects to be at Worlds. If they lose to Rogue here like John and I are projecting, then we see them going into the loser's bracket and potentially facing a very hot Schalke team that already beat them right at the end of the split. So Fnatic could end up missing Worlds here if they can't pull a win out in these next two matchups. Over to the LCS, John. I know you're anxiously awaiting Well, Nation, one. that will do it for this episode <laughs> of Level Up Live. <laughs> Let's cut it there. We don't need to. We're fine. John is stoked for this matchup. Uh, so we touched on a lot of these matchups last week. We talked about Dignitas and TSM. We talked about EG and 100 Thieves. I believe it was on Monday, actually. Uh, FlyQuest taking down EG before that. Golden Guardians going 3-0 against TSM. But tonight, we have one more match to add to that list. And that is FlyQuest, as they are flying high past Cloud9. In fact, 3-1 pulling off the win tonight. Typical Cloud9. They, they've they ended the summer split on an absolutely horrific low note going one and one for several weeks in a row then going oh and two and then finishing the split one and one they're so out of form i don't even know what to think of that the the, the team anymore uh it's it's not surprising FlyQuest has been in great form they've been playing out of their mind cloud nine they've been sputtering and it it the proof is right there three one to FlyQuest. that's not knocking FlyQuest. they officially qualify for worlds now um and they punch their tickets into the semifinals here but for cloud nine now you're going to go up against evil geniuses. You know, it, it's not going to be an easy matchup, you know, especially with the way Cloud Nine's been playing. You know, they're one loss away from being knocked out of this thing. It's it's not a good look for Cloud Nine. They need to figure it out real quick. Reaper needs to get that team together. Maybe Jack needs to sit down. Maybe they have that same conversation they had with the team the other year uh, when Sneaky was still on it. Maybe people need to be benched. Maybe there needs to be some conversation here, but this is not the same Cloud Nine team. We watched for 80% of this split. This team is, there's something not right with the way they're playing. So some people could go about the approach that, hey, maybe they're just not playing in their greatest form. They've looked a little bad here at the end of the summer split. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach. So John has been bringing up all these conspiracy theories all night long. It feels <laughs> like I'm with Panicking Pat on tonight's show. Um, but one of the things, John, uh, we've always seen Cloud9 make that triumphant run through the gauntlet of N.A., is that what we're looking for here? Is this C9 saying, oh, we just need to drop down a little bit to make a little run here? Uh, I, I just, I don't think that's the case. Um, but Cloud9 has looked sloppy. Uh, maybe they end up getting their little kind of gauntlet buff in a sense where they end up getting that nice little run at the end here through a loser's bracket. Um, but overall, they're just not looking that great. They have not been on form, like you said. Again, no knock to FlyQuest. I think FlyQuest is playing extremely well right now. Santorin especially really setting great pace for that team. Cloud9 now takes up Evil Geniuses next. In round three of the playoffs, EG is coming off of a really bad loss to fly or a decent loss to fly quest. It was three, two. And then EG ended up sweeping 100 threes, three to zero. 100 thieves not really sealing too many wins as the thieves of this split. Um, but EG overall, do you think they're a contender up against C9 or do you think C9 bounces back against them in this next round? I think anyone's a contender against cloud nine right now. Uh, unless they can figure it out, unless their, their, their macro play improves, unless their draft improves, their communication, like... I would love to be a fly on the wall in that team meeting to find out what really is going on because just you can see from their play style, it has completely changed like right around, you know, that that week seven, week eight part of, of the split here. And it's just been it's just been bad. Like they're not like it almost feels like 
there's not a shot color. It feels like, you know, they're they're a little all over the place. They're they're that sloppy cloud nine that's high risk, high reward, but high risk and incredibly bad reward also. You know, if if any major forced team fights or forced objective that isn't really there for them goes wrong. And and that's what we're seeing is cloud nine is just making really bad in-game decisions. Um I'm not really going to point fingers at the draft. I, I mean, their draft has been okay. It's nothing that really blows me away. Like, they're not memeing TSM XD or anything like that. You know, so, you know, it, it's not like they're they're just memeing the whole thing. Um, but their in-game play has been very sus, and I think anyone going up against Cloud9 right now is in a good position to knock Cloud9 out. So I have to give Evil Genius the benefit of the doubt here. They could easily take care of Cloud9 here in round three. I mean, I think Cloud9 just peaked a little too early. They ended up having a great run in spring. They were feeling really good entering into summer. They did all right at the start of summer, but then they've fallen off since then. I feel like one of the big factors is, like you said, the draft is one of them. The lack thereof, a shot caller, it feels like Vulcan looked really strong in spring. He was making great calls. The team was adjusting really well. It seemed like communication was there across the board. Now it just doesn't feel like it's there as cleanly. And I'm starting to wonder if maybe we didn't really see a player change. We haven't really seen a giant tactics change from my knowledge. I think one of the big things it could be is they just weren't challenged in the spring. As they were completely dominating teams, they weren't really being forced to develop. They weren't being forced to make changes, to continue to try different styles. They just kind of stuck with what was working. Now in the summer, we have tons and tons of different challengers stepping up. A lot of teams have made big adjustments heading into the summer split. A lot of teams have gotten better in different roles and changed positions around. And now you're looking at Cloud9 that's like, okay, we had this style. It worked really well for us in spring but it's no longer working for us in summer and we're not adapting quick enough in game and outside of the game. They haven't really tried enough styles to really have that adaption available in the draft either. So to me, it's like, I'm really going to say they just peaked too early. I think for a cloud nine squad, I think they came online a little too early and with Reaper as the coach, I think there's definitely the potential to still get things back underway. But as we're getting later and later in the split now into playoffs, now into the third round of playoffs, it's getting a little try now or never try. Cause you're not going to make worlds if you don't get it together. Uh, for this EG matchup in particular, EG's hot. I mean, this is a FlyQuest team that just took down C9 3-1, to one, and before that, they went five games up against EG. EG also shut down 100 Thieves. Again, not the greatest opponent. Um, I think Cloud9 comes out on top of this one, but I think it's going to be close. I think it goes five games. Uh, I would not be stunned if EG pulls it off either. I wouldn't be stunned if it's 3-1 EG, to be completely honest. It I wouldn't hope surprise not. me one bit. I hope they pull it together, sir. But the other matchup we have to talk about is Golden Guardians up against Team Liquid. Uh, Team Liquid and Golden Guardians both having a little fun here and there. Golden Guardians with that 3-0 over TSM. Team Liquid, a rough spring split, but they've really pulled it together in the summer. Do you take Team Liquid to continue to rise to the top here, taking down GG, or do you think Golden Guardians continue to shine? It's the year of the underdog. Why not? The, the LEC is a hot mess with, with Rogue and Mad Lions at the top of the table. Why not Golden Guardians? Why not Golden Guardians taking down one of the best teams on paper for like the third year in a row in Team Liquid? Why not? Who says they can't? I I'm going to go Golden Guardians in five games. I like it. I'm going to go TL in four. I think TL takes this one 3-1, but I do expect Golden Guardians not to be knocked out just yet. I think they will win their next matchup. I'm stoked. I think this is fun. We have a lot of great playoff action. Again, DC fandom for fans of DC superheroes and DC games like Batman. Lots of good stuff ahead. And the end of Summer Bash, if those want to compete in Rocket League or Valorant, go ahead and register. There's only a few spots left for that tournament. Again, we can post that in the chat after the show. Thanks again for listening, guys. It's always a pleasure. Well, Nation, that will do it for this edition of Level Up Live. But before you go, head on over to patreon.com slash OTN and consider becoming a part of the Overtime Network. In return, you'll get access to exclusive content that nobody else in the world can get unless they are a part of OTN Media. If you haven't already, make sure you follow the show here on Twitch to catch the next episode of Level Up Live. If you are listening to the show on our podcast feed, leave us a review. Level Up Podcast is available on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, and Google Play. We would love to hear from you. In fact, we love to hear from all of our viewers and listeners so much. We have other ways for you to interact with us and the show. Joey, where else can Level Up Nation go to interact with us? Level Up Nation, head on over to Twitter and find us at Level Up Live. That is L-V-L-U-P Live. In addition to that, you can follow OTN as well on Twitter and Facebook at OTN Media. 
and then on Instagram at OTN underscore media. Last but not least, guys, we stream regularly throughout the week on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash OTN media. This show Mondays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern time. All right, Nation, make sure you tune in this upcoming Monday, August 24th, as we cover the latest and greatest in gaming and esports news. Do your ears a favor. Slap that sub button to know when the next episode is ready for your viewing pleasures. We will catch you on Monday. Have a great weekend. And remember, be nice to your fellow gamers online. And as always, level, level up. up.